Just to know that we are meeting together in this space, yeah, in the Toy Road in Germiston is one of the places where we come together. Why is this important? Because the Bible says, do not forsake the gathering of yourselves together. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25. We rehearsed that already. And I know for those of you who are in the other two, two locations, it's not really the best thing that I'm preaching to you. So it's my job in Joburg City Church to prepare other preachers. And uh, at the moment, I'm preaching. It's been beamed into the other two locations. But those are independent or autonomous churches operating together. So the first thing we need to know is the church is not the church until it comes together. Can I say that again? The word ecclesia, it's a Greek word. It means when God's people come together. So you can't sit in different locations and be together. Amen? You actually have to be under the same tree. If you, you know, if you're meeting under a tree somewhere. But it's the togetherness that makes up the church. You can't be at home watching Zoom and be in church. Okay, you can watch teaching, that's great, you can watch this teaching, and that's useful in itself, but being at church or in church means to be gathered together. That's the first thing I want you to know and see. The second thing that, I, that we've been talking about is, why do we sit down while we're talking? Well, for a number of reasons, because the group is small in these various locations, you know, if we were all together, it would be easier if I stood up, then more people could see me. But actually, when Jesus taught in the synagogues, he always sat down. You can read about this in Luke chapter 4. He would sit down and he would teach. And I don't know about you, I like copying Jesus. I like to do what he does as much as I can. Like things like raising the dead, healing the sick. I like copying that, including sitting down on the chair when I talk. So we can do that here because... We have a small enough group in this room. And because I'm being beamed onto a screen in these other locations, they too can watch on that screen and I'm sitting down. So just remember, the ideal is that you attend a church where somebody's preaching in that location. Now, we're working really hard on that. Uh, the, the, the fact is that Burger's away. He would be preaching in the other location. And in the Edenvale location, we could actually have Ryan or Chantal preaching, but they are so busy, they are not able to finish their preparation on time. So there are some of you who are, who've done the Yellow Book Toolkit. I'm going to look at you right now, <laughs> which means you should be getting ready to go to those places and preach. Put your hand up, call me, say, John, I'm ready to preach. And what's really great is you've got sermon material. You've got, you know, we're all doing what is the five things that God wants you to do with your life. You can go and minister in those other churches that are operating on a Sunday morning. And then I thought we'd do another thing because the singing is happening in the three different locations. Uh, for instance, in Edenvale, somebody's <coughs> leading worship there and there's singing going on. In Boxburg, somebody's leading worship there and somebody's singing. And I just wanted you to see how important singing is. So turn in your Bible. Well, don't turn in your Bible. I'll just read it out for you. It says these words in Matthew 26 and verse 30. When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Who sung the hymn? Jesus and his disciples at the Last Supper. They sang hymns together. We just, again, what are we doing? We're copying Jesus and his disciples. We're singing hymns together, not because Yil's song made singing famous, which they did. 
okay, choral singing where a whole congregation sings together. We're doing it because Jesus practiced that. Paul actually says in another verse, I'll read that one for you as well, in Ephesians 5 and verse 19. It says, speak to, another, to one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Making melody in your heart, making music in your heart to the Lord. So you can hear when you're standing next to somebody singing, on the top of your voice, you're actually ministering to that person next to you, no matter how bad your voice is. All of you go, amen, that's me. Okay, some of us have really great voices, and that's great. But actually singing and making melody in your heart is you singing songs to the Lord, and you encouraging the person next to you to sing as well. Especially if you have a poor voice, but you still belt it out because you're doing it as unto the Lord, aren't you? So all of our practices are happening in these three locations at the moment. A fourth one uh, online in terms of, you know, Bryanston and Four Ways, which is coming online. So there's all of these locations. And I want you to be praying about this for those of you who are watching. We're going to have a Super Sunday. What's a Super Sunday? A Super Sunday is when all the house churches come together in a school hall or a venue or a place like that where we can all get together. We can't all get together in this space. This space is too small. But I want you to understand that the Bible calls church, the gathering together, where there are two or three. There are more than three of us here. But the other thing is that we're meeting in the name of the Lord. Amen? If you're not meeting in the name of the Lord, if you're not saying, Jesus, come and present yourself with us and speak to us by your Holy Spirit, then you could be in the local chess club or the local golf club or, you know, the lion's club. But because we're meeting, we're more than three, and we're meeting together in the name of Jesus, we have in church. Amen. Say thank you Jesus that I'm in church. The other great thing of course is that I want us to I want us to pray for those next to us who've lost family or friends close or more distant to sickness over this period. Okay, some people have said well I didn't actually die that person didn't actually die from the virus they died from dehydration. That's actually why, why Keith passed away, a dear close friend who was a member of this church. He died because he didn't take in enough liquid while he got the virus. So I want you to raise your hand if you would like somebody in the room, the person next to you, to pray for you. And I'm going to pray a prayer for those of us who've lost a loved one. Is there anybody that wants to do that? You, it's fresh on your heart. You think about it a lot. If there isn't anybody, I don't know if in the other locations there are. So you can go ahead and do that as well. But then I want you to also raise your hand because there's nobody that seems to have knows anybody that passed away except for our brother Keith. Kate, maybe you have a family member that, as I say, didn't pass away from COVID, but actually just passed away because they got ill. And I do want you to pray for one another. Jesus instructs us to do that. But I also want us to point out, so you guys over there who are praying for the person in the room around you, that's great. But I also want you to raise your hand if you were sick over the last eight months. If it were any of you sick. Can you just look around and see who's recovered around you? We need to give thanks and praise to Jesus for that, isn't that so? Because this is what we're going to learn today. We're going to learn that we are all one body in Christ. When one part of the body suffers, we all suffer. If we don't suffer, if one person is honored, like we saw Joan getting honored for the first time, for stepping out in faith, we all are honoring him. And we all get honor because of his 
act of faith to say, I'm going to faith this. I don't feel completely comfortable leading a church of worship, but I'm going to step out. Can you hear that? We honored him this morning. So this is what's happening across the city, and I want us to get this and understand this in our thinking, because a lot of people are struggling going to a church building, okay? A lot of people are struggling, and so they're just not going to church. They're just not, I, we, we have, I literally have calls the whole week of people who are saying, can I come to church? Because they expect us to be having that meeting in the Sunday building. And, we, and I say, sure you can. There's these three locations. And they go, well, where are those? And I go, they're houses you can go and meet in. And they're like, well, that's not church. Do you understand? This is what's so difficult for people to take on board. Because they have a traditional position. That in order to have church, you have to be in a building. The Bible describes us as living stones, living bricks, being joined together. And every time we come together, we are joined together. And God presences himself with his spirit here amongst us. So we're going to read about this this morning. Turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And we're going to talk about being in the body. In other words, what have we been doing for the last year and two months? We've been talking about five things that God wants you to do with your life. Five things that God wants you to do with your life. What was the first thing he said? I want you to have dominion. I don't want something ruling over you. I don't want your diet ruling over you. I don't want your fear ruling over you. And I don't want Satan ruling over you. I don't want sickness ruling over you. I want you to rule over it. That's the first thing that God wants us to do. A lot of people ask me this question. John, what's God's will for my life? And I say, your, God's will for your life is that you live a life of dominion. This is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning your life. The second thing that he wants you to do is make disciples or multiply his image. It's not my job. Some people say, well, it's easy for you to do it, John. You get paid. Huh? No, no. It's all our jobs to make disciples. And remember what 2021 is. 2021 is make one disciple this year. This 2021 is the year of making one disciple. That's all you have to do. Now, the scary thing about a disciple is they follow your example. And you'll go, oh, I'm not comfortable with that. Why? Because you want to be perfect before somebody follows you. Yes, only Jesus is perfect. Get over yourself. Amen? Amen? If you think I'm perfect, you are seriously mistaken. Spend five minutes with my wife and ask her. <laughs> so don't use the excuse of, well, it's the perfect guys, the guys who get a salary for doing this. It's their job to make disciples. No, we're all called in life to multiply the image of God, make disciples in somebody else. Some of us, it's just our children. Now look at Shona over there, and I see how she's cooperating to help her children come into the image of the likeness of God. That's called making disciples. It's easy for it with us with our children, isn't that so? We could just say, listen, on Sunday we go to church. And they go, yes, mom. <laughs> the other way around. And not the other way around. Hey, mommy, I want to play PlayStation <laughs> this morning. No, no, no. And I always say that as long as you're paying the bills... You got an added advantage. Amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> Use that advantage because you lose it at 18. <laughs> Try. <laughs> <laughs> the third thing that God wants us to do with our lives, we know, is to work. And the big headline about work is you must do work in faith as an act of worship. That's what the Bible teaches about. The third thing that God wants you to do with your life. And of course, we've got to the fourth one, which is God wants us to steward primarily our time. How are you spending your time? What are you doing with your time? 
And we've looked at stewarding our time, hearing the word of God, stewarding our time, learning to listen to the Holy Spirit, point to your stomach and say, morning, Holy Spirit. Amen. Don't talk to God like this. Oh, God, where does God live? He lives inside you. And you have to get comfortable with that, don't you? Because you realize that the Holy Spirit is seeing what you see. He's looking at what you look at. You know, when I watch some of those movies on one of these channels, I go, oh, I don't know if I want the Holy Spirit to see that. There's this massive cooperation with you and the Holy Spirit because he's decided to live inside your body. He could live in a building, but he's decided to live inside your body. And so you steward in your time, spending time with the Holy Spirit. He goes wherever you go. He's the God who is with you all the time. God, the Holy Spirit. And then the fifth thing that God wants us to do with our lives is he wants us to, to get married. Okay, so if you're not married, understand that it's God's will that you get married. Once you accept that, you've got to get over this obstacle. I'm not looking for the perfect bloke. Okay? Because again, do you think of yourself as the perfect gal? <laughs> Tanya, where are you going? <laughs> so God wants us to get married. But let's go back to the stewardship. Because not only are you stewarding your time of hearing the word of God. And I suggested to you that you use at least two hours a week to hear God's word being taught. You're spending an half an hour now. So tick that box if you want to do that. But remember not to make it a dead word. But you are hearing the word of God on a week by week basis. That's what God wants you to do. And then remember that he wants you to steward the time with the Holy Spirit. But then he wants you to steward time with the most important people in your life. Like your husband or your wife and your children. But we've been speaking about stewarding time with other members of the church. And this is what Paul is speaking about. Let's read it together in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And we're going to read from verse 12. It says, the body is a unit. Though it is made up of many parts, and though all its parts are many, they form one body. So it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit into one body. Whether we Jews or Greeks or Portuguese or whatever. We, we were all baptized by the spirit. Whether we were slave or free. Whether we rich or poor. We were all given the one spirit to drink from. Now the body is not made up. Is, is, is not made of one part, but of many. If your foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body. It would not for that reason cease to be part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body. It would not for that reason cease to be part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has arranged the parts of the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body. You can see from this text that Paul says a couple of things about belonging to a church. The first obstacle that you need to understand is that people say, I belong to the big church of Joburg. This morning, I trust that all over the city of Joburg, people who are Christians are meeting together. And in one way, you are part of that universal church, the city church of Joburg. We are all part of that, aren't we? 
Now, our problem is we all meet in little different buildings. And here's the bigger problem. We all have different names for ourselves. Think of all the different names that are out there. Understand that we selected. We didn't even select the name. God gave us the name Joburg City Church because we're not trying to say we are different to the church. We are saying we are part of this big church called the city that meets in the city of Joburg. We might not even know the guy that meets in the church down the road called Thrive or another name. There's so many different names, aren't there? You see, people say a name because they want their own identity. But actually, there's one identity that we are in the church of the Lord Jesus in the city of Joburg. You know, when Jesus prayed about this in John 17, he said, Father, I pray that they may be one. Now, you can't be one if you are in, if you believe different things. You understand that? It's impossible to be one. And people say, ah, oh, you know, John, we can't really be one because we all interpret the Bible differently. Yeah, that's what's wrong, isn't it? In fact, Jesus said these words, we can never reach the world when we all believe differently. He says, by this, will the whole world know that you are my disciples if you are, if you are one with one another. Does he mean we all meet in the same location? No, he means we all believe the same thing. That's a tough one, isn't it? Because some people believe you can lose your salvation. Some people believe you can't. Some people are just like, I don't know. Won't you tell me what I should believe? <laughs> you see, nobody studies to find out what the Bible actually teaches. That's why we have a high emphasis on study in a group. Because we're trying to get to oneness all the time. Because there's so many things that are affected because we don't all believe the same. So think of church history. Think of where, for instance, the Protestant movement came from. You know how that happened? You know what Protestant means? It means we protest. A man came along and he said, I don't believe what the Roman Catholic Church believes. And I'm going to take a nail with a piece of paper and nail on the door of the church 91 reasons why I don't believe what the, Catholic, the Roman Catholic Church believes. We call that the beginning of the Reformation. The changing of the church. And it got the name Protestant. How many of you belong to a thing called Methodist church? Can you hear the word method? Because they said there's a method. The guy by the name of John Wesley said, there's a method to following God. There's a, myth, a method. And he, he came up with a whole lot of methods. And then there were... How many of you belong to the Pentecostal? What is Pentecostal? Are we, we going to emphasize the coming of the Holy Spirit upon us, which happened at Pentecost? That's our thing, bro. And so we all gather in little groups around our favorite truth. Instead of around the whole Bible. And what it teaches. And most Christians today don't even read their Old Testament. That's incredibly difficult, isn't it? So can you see that to be one, Paul says these words. Do you know that you were baptized by the Spirit into one church? Into one body. Now there's a local expression of the church right here called the body of Christ that meets at 19 de Toy Road. Or Girardi Street. Or the street there in, in Edinburgh. Which I can never remember. <laughs> but I want you to notice the word baptized. What does the word baptized mean? So I've got a special illustration to do. And I'm going to ask my beloved assistant James to come up. And I'm going to baptize him today. And you've all seen this. Come on James. Just woke James up on me sleep there a little bit. <laughs> Sit on the chair. 
because I want you to get you, don't move the chair, just sit on it. <laughs> so I'm going to baptize him because this is what the word, can you see the words? He says, you were all baptized by the Holy Spirit into Christ's body. The word baptized means to be covered over. No, no, you must, don't, don't mess with my baptism moment here. <laughs> What does the word baptize mean? It means that he became so one with this that he lost his personal identity. You see, the minute we say baptize, we think of water. But yet it says we were baptized by the spirit into the body. So when you became part of this body, you lost something of your personal identity. You were joined to this group of people. That's what the word baptized means. It means to be covered over, to be immersed. You've all heard us use that word. I've been immersed into Joburg City Church. My identity is no longer just my surname. So think of your surname. My identity is Joburg City Church. That's my, you're not under there. No. Okay, you're right. <laughs> this is now my new identity. I'm no longer Portuguese. I'm no longer Afrikaans, English. I'm, I, I still am culturally, but for eternity, I'm part of Christ's body. I'm fully immersed. You see, this baptism in the body is like heaven coming to earth. Because there's no longer, look what it says in the next verse. He says, there's no Jews or Greeks or blacks or whites or, or rich or poor. We are all being baptized by the Spirit into Christ's body. Can you see what baptism means? Now, the same thing happens when you baptize with water. There's a moment, even if it's just for a second, where you become one with the water and you disappear under the water. What's that saying? My identity became one with the water. Now, this is super important. Thanks, James. Don't fall asleep there again. Because <laughs> I will call you up. <laughs> So can you see that word, why this word one is so important? Now, let me say this to you. Your, your style of Christianity will not work until you get this revelation that just was demonstrated for you. Jesus says your prayers won't be answered. How many of you prayed and it doesn't get answered? Because you don't understand oneness. The Bible illustrates this in an amazing story. There was two things that I saw this week in the form of a story. The first one was Israel as a nation, their army, 610,000 fighting men. <clears throat> marching on a city called Jericho. They took the, the city in Zap. Seven days, they didn't fire an arrow. They didn't shoot a shot. They went down the road after conquering that city to a small little tiny town with a small little tiny wall. And for the life of them, they could not take that city. They got beaten back every time. And when you read the story, you think, okay, Jericho, high wall, difficult city to take. Pofader, <laughs> small little town, easy to take. Why couldn't they take it? Because the story tells us that one of the people from the last conquest took some treasure and he buried it under his tent. And the whole army suffered and people died because one person forgot that they are part of that unit called the fighting army of God. You see, whatever you do, whether you like it or not, it affects me. Amen? If I don't see you week on week, if I don't make that connection with you week on week, I start to suffer. You know, when so, some of you do this, you say, you send me a message, 
John, will you pray for me? I don't go, you are brew or send you. I go and I pray for you. Because I know that you are part of me and I'm part of you. Look down at verse 26 in your Bible. Look at what Paul says in the same chapter. Look at verse 26. Let's just glance down there. Because I want you to see that this is where we miss in so much of what we're supposed to enjoy as the body of Christ. Verse 26. If one part suffers, what happens? Every part suffers. Every part suffers. I, conversely, as well, it says, if one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. When I was stuck in Ivory Coast with Ryan, when we were stuck there, the Lord gave me a word. He said, son, when you get back to South Africa, I'm going to honor you. And he did. And he is. And guess what? This body called Joburg City Church is getting honor all over the place. Why? Because he's honoring me. That's the word he gave to me. It really is happening. All over the place. People are saying, John, can't we have one of those things <laughs> that you're doing in Pretoria? Or in East London? Or in PE? Or in can we, can we, can, how can we have one of those? You can, you can you hear that's honor. Now, I get honored by people asking me that. But you know what? Because you are living in the space in your Christianity, you also get in honor. That's why people say to you, hey, you know, what's this weird church you're doing? <laughs> that's what it looks like. And we forget, Paul says that, he says, when one part suffers, you know, my daughter had the most amazing experience this week. It just blew me away to describe this very thing. It <laughs> says these words, or this is what she was telling me. Her, the nursery school teacher, the owner of the nursery school, went, got a virus and went paralyzed. Literally, Beautiful, strong woman was in a wheelchair. And the doctors were like, we don't know what's happening here. Now, my daughter was told this because she, the, her child doesn't go to nursery school anymore. But she still is part of the same body of believers. And so she heard a message from a friend. They said, do you know, do you know, uh, I don't want to say her name, do you know, the, the lady that is the principal, she is in a wheelchair. She's paralyzed. And so my, my daughter said she walked into their, their sunroom. And as she sat down to start to think and to pray for this nursery school, she became paralyzed in her arm. And the Lord said to her, pray until the paralysis goes. So my daughter sat there for two hours, praying in the spirit, interceding, taking on the burden of a loved one that's not her family. And so she, after she, the, the paralysis in my daughter's arm left, gone. And so she went the next day to see this school teacher. And as she walked in the door, the school teacher got up out of her wheelchair. And walked over to her and just held her and said, you've brought me healing. Can you hear how the body works? This paralysis, which she prayed and got healed, healed somebody else. Now people say, oh man, I wish I'd get somebody up out of a wheelchair. That's pretty amazing stuff. Yeah, become part of the body. Start to carry the burdens of each other. In life. And you will see what God will do with your life. You see, we kind of think that we have a choice on this. Look at verse 18. Let's just close with verse 18. So I've received the signal that I've passed my 30 minutes. So let's read verse 18. Because this is so important. Let's look at verse 18, what it says. But in fact... God has arranged, everybody say, 
God has arranged. You don't arrange. Amen? You see, the thing that we get wrong as Christians, we think that when we become a Christian, we get a choice. People actually say that to me. They ask me, do you believe in God's sovereignty or do you believe in free choice? And I'm not talking about should I eat pepperoni pizza or should I eat pizza with, you know, cabbage on, God forbid. But <laughs> I'm not talking about that kind of choice. For certain things, like the body, God has arranged it like. God has predecided. You actually don't get a choice on this. How many of you happy about no, how many of you not happy about that? Because we live in a postmodern world where we believe everything is up for negotiation. With God, we're like, okay, God, let me tell you how you do this. We even teach our kids that, don't we? We, we start, I, I, I tease my, my children, I say, when you're raising my grandchildren, and I'm the grandparent, you know what a grandparent is? It's somebody who's greater than the parent. <laughs> right? <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen? Do I hear an amen from the grandparents? <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> and I always say, for certain things, don't negotiate with your children. Now, some things you can negotiate. But don't say, pick up your toys, please. <laughs> say, go in your room and pick up your toys. You all are looking at me like, is that real? <laughs> <laughs> so the top clinical psychologist in the world has said these words. No is also an answer. And don't say, no, you can't do that. I'm sorry that I said no to you. That's not going to help your children. And it's not going to help my grandchildren. So I'm trusting my children are watching this. <laughs> <laughs> this is the problem. We think that God hasn't predecided things. And God has predecided. Pre Verse 18 is saying that God has decided. That you will be part of a body of believers. And until he tells you differently. You are part of that. When he looks upon, across the city. And he's made you part of a body. That's how he will treat you. You could say God I don't like that. He kind of says to you tough bananas. <laughs> this is why prayer doesn't work. This is why righteousness in your life is not working. Righteousness, peace, and joy are our benefit. But it doesn't work, especially the one that really disturbs me when I have to go pray for somebody because they say, John, I've been praying for this and nothing's working. It's not working. You know, we are like Americans. Americans are what we call utilitarian. If it works, it must be God. Huh? And then when it doesn't work, like, okay, maybe God doesn't want to do that. No, no. It's healthy to go, Lord, why is it that you're not answering that prayer? And I want to suggest, Paul is suggesting the Bible, God is telling us that we haven't seen that he has decided to join you to this body. The stewardship of your relationship means... That the more unity that you can have with those around you, and you think about it, you only do it four hours a week, maximum, determines your agreement that you've been baptized into this body. This is the great conclusion that we come to from this section of text. God is speaking to you. Can you hear him speaking to you? Ask yourself, Lord, what do I have to adjust in my life to become a more immersed member of this body? 
What do I have to change? What do I have to adjust? What do I have to change my thinking in and my actions in? In order to demonstrate my baptism into this body. God, all the principalities and powers, and your fellow believers are waiting to hear you come in agreement with God. Amen? Let's pray together. Father, thank you for the body of Christ. Wow, Lord, it's such a blessing. I just always remember what it was like to not be part of the church. It was, her it, it was, it was horrible, God. And it was like the devil had open season on my life all the time. He just beat on me because there was no body immersion and protection. But now, thank you. Thank you that you, by your spirit, have baptized me into this body. Lord, I pray for each one who is needing to make this decision of immersion, that you will help them, Lord. You will lead them into this truth as you promised your Holy Spirit will. Forgive us, Lord, for resisting the Spirit, for quenching the Spirit. In Jesus' name, we turn to you in love and obedience. Amen and amen. Bless you guys. Thank you.